You'd be forgiven here for thinking that you'd just entered the Matrix, only it's run by Wes Craven and not machines. Well, you're half right. The Evil Within borrows from many tropes across games and films to create a truly unique psychological horror that will shock you, scare you, enthrall you and frustrate you in equal measure. My name is Nick, this is Deep Dives and welcome to the world of The Evil Within. Find myself within Darkness twisting me around There is nothing I can do And this world doesn't spin It just turns itself For anyone new, Deep Dives is a series where I take an extended look right inside the guts of various video games, talking about facts, figures, some of the more obscure stuff behind the scenes, and anything I think might be interesting. For The Evil Within, I have to warn you, there is lots of graphic content, so if you're squeamish, it's probably best to turn off now. But if you live for the gore, then stay tuned as we look at some gnarly and quite frankly radical scenes from this glorious video game. As a side note, when I make these videos, I do extensive research to make sure I've got my facts right and explain as much as I can. Well, in The Evil Within, there are quite a few holes to say the least, so sadly there are some things that are left without explanation. I will, however, do my best to tidy The Evil Within into a nice, neat little package. Right folks, let's get started with some basics. Back in 2010, Shinji Mikami started work on Evil Within under codename Project Spy, with his own studio, Tango Gameworks, developing the project. Not long after, Tango Gameworks was bought by Zenimax Media, who, you know, might own some other relevant studios and IPs. After three years in development, the Evil Within was announced during the 2013 E3 conference with a brilliantly gory live-action trailer not showing any gameplay, but giving us an idea of what Mikami was going for. Over a year and a half passed before The Evil Within finally launched on October 14th, 2014 in North America and EU territories. A special version was released to the Japanese market on the 23rd of October, 2014, removing all the gore in order to give it a D content rating, meaning it could be sold to customers aged 17 and above. Thankfully, DLC was available to put the blood back in. Oh, and The Evil Within is also known as Psycho Break in Japan. The Evil Within was initially quite hard to follow due to some unexplained holes in the plot. Thankfully, in March and April of 2015, Judy Kidman's DLC The Assignment and The Consequence was released, filling in a lot of plot holes left by the original game. The final DLC, The Executioner, was released on May the 25th, 2015, which let you play as the Keeper in a side story involving Mobius after the events of the main game. The premise of The Evil Within was to turn horror back to its roots, as Mikami felt modern horror games were no longer about survival and instead about how much ass you could kick. Even saying that, The Evil Within feels like an updated Resident Evil 4, but at the time, less clean. It maintained the motion of Resident Evil 4, but managed to be janky enough to make you feel uncomfortable when you play. By design, players are meant to feel powerless, with combat often taking place in tight corridors and confined spaces, limiting ammunition and putting you in unavoidable situations that promote running away over tackling the big scary beasts. According to Ikumi Nakamura, The Evil Within did not start as a horror game, but at one point it was sci-fi, and at another point, more of an open world game. After much deliberation and trying to take into account what the players wanted, Mikami decided to go back to his horror roots. Wanting to create something memorable, the team at Tango wrestled with just what survival horror is conceptually. With people generally being predisposed to reject new things, the team at Tango each had their own fears. 
Nakamura focused on the fact that we feel comfort in the familiar and remember those things more easily. She took inspiration from real-world ideas and started designing, utilising well-known concepts and tropes, blending it with a Japanese horror style. A major part of the game's design was the inclusion of traps. This often means charging off blindly without checking your corners can get you into serious trouble. It's even worse when a big horrible bastard is chasing you and you're simultaneously trying to dodge mines that explode with barbed wire. That's not to say Sebastian is completely defenceless. Aside from your usual assortment of weapons, the most versatile weapon you'll find is the Agony Crossbow, a brilliant weapon with varying types of craftable bolts, making for some entertaining and heart-pumping encounters. Also, run out of bolts? Well, just craft some on the fly. Time slows slightly when on the menu, but never really stops, so you don't want to take too long. But the ability to craft on the fly made it all the more exciting. Annoyingly, there were two bolt types that you would not have seen unless you bought a special edition of the game or pre-ordered the original version. And that's the poison and incendiary bolts. Annoying mainly because they are really good. I guess money does indeed win. Anyway, now it's time for a very brief rundown of the plot. You take on the role of Sebastian Castellanos, voiced by Anson Mount, who is a detective working for the Crimson City Police Department. Sebastian, along with co-workers Julie Kidman and Joseph Oda, are on their way to Beacon Mental Hospital to investigate a report of multiple homicides. Upon arriving, they discover an absolute massacre and one survivor, Dr. Marcelo Jimenez careful of this one, he's a bit of a dick, but more on that later. Upon checking some CCTV footage, Sebastian watches the carnage on camera and then is magically attacked by a hooded assailant, waking up some time later in a place you definitely wouldn't want to visit. Cue fun and games as Sebastian tries to work out what the hell is going on, dodge the evil mind monsters and also escape the mental prison. Now it's clear at this point that you are no longer in what is to be considered the real world, but how did this happen? In order to get a proper understanding of what's going on, we firstly need to take a look at the big machine that controls the events in the evil within. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? As I mentioned at the beginning, STEM is a little bit like the Matrix, only its landscape is shaped by those that inhabit it. STEM is capable of bringing together the consciousness of multiple people and placing them in a shared world, much like the Matrix. The original design used the bathtub-like pods called Terminus, where people can be hardwired in via cable and plug. In order for STEM to work, however, it requires a main brain to act as its core, this main brain's mental patterns would then be used to map a virtual world and other subjects could be plugged in and inhabit that world. The stem, as we know it, was cooked up by the Evil Within's big bad, Ruvik, as a way to create a reality of his own making where he could spend time with his dead sister. In truth, stem has been developed over centuries, with research firstly by the Cedar Hill Church cult and secondly by Mobius. A direct quote from The Art of the Evil Within would explain, it has been developed for centuries, resulting in several variations of this contraption. Once linked, the machine is known to rid its victim of their sanity, but the ultimate purpose remains hidden. Hmm, that sounds nice! An audio log would explain how archaic the research was. After months of secret subterfuge and indoctrination, they brought me into their fold. This place is elaborate to say the least. Despite the modernistic visage, the research they have been doing here seems to date back to over a century ago. Most of what the researchers have been working on, however, seems archaic by today's standards. Mobius clearly has an eye for talent, and the skills of one Dr. Marcelo Jimenez was brought to their attention, eventually bringing him on board after months of vetting. Even then, Jimenez had an eye on a young Ruben Victoriano and his studies, citing that one day he would assist Jimenez in his own studies. Then of course, Ruben had a run-in with the villagers, resulting in the death of his sister and heavy scarring, psychologically and physically. 
After this, Ruben became more obsessed with turning his dream into a reality. Jimenez helped out a young Ruben, providing him with materials and patience to test on. Yep, this is definitely all above board and there's nothing bad to see here. <coughs> <coughs> Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Ruben, Dr. Jimenez was trying to please Mobius, who were growing ever impatient with his progress. In the end, he resorted to fessing up about STEM while carelessly mentioning it was designed by a pupil of his. Of course, Mobius became immediately interested in the young lad. This research here, this is exactly what we've been looking for. I call it STEM. I'm sure you and your superiors will find this most satisfactory. You mentioned the design was from a pupil of yours. And in that case, where do you fit in? He is an unstable individual. Clearly, Jimenez knows he's messed up and cites Ruben's instability as a reason to keep him in the loop. They asked Jimenez to bring young Ruben on board, giving them both better facilities to work from, and for a time the arrangement actually worked. Well, until Mobius put more pressure on the pair to produce results. For Jimenez's continued loyalty, they promoted him to director of Beacon Mental Hospital. Firstly, however, they wanted him to have a reputation. So Jimenez decided to publish Ruben's work under his own name, thinking Ruben wouldn't notice. You published my research in your name again. Did you think I wouldn't find out? But he totally noticed! As a result of Mobius' applied pressure, Ruben started working from home more often and in private. There, he made some changes behind the scenes so that STEM only worked with his own brainwave patterns. Of course, Jimenez was horrified when he discovered this, but things got worse when Mobius found out. With Jimenez refusing to take the blame, he dobbed Ruben into Mobius and with the help of some operatives, dragged Ruben down to the facility to fix the changes. After Ruvik refused to backtrack on his changes at the behest of Mobius, they killed him removed his brain and placed it within the centre of STEM in order to act as its core, simulating an artificial body to keep his mind alive. It's mentioned by Jimenez in a flashback and in an audio log. What have you done to Ruben? Show me! Keep your emotions out of this, Jimenez. He brought this upon himself. We gave him a chance. Where is he? This is despicable. What is this monstrosity? Despicable? Coming from the man using his own patience to further his own research? I saw what they have done to him, and I am appalled. To think the young boy I mentored is now this. A mass of grey matter in a glorified test tube. Could they have been planning this all along? And what have I become in all of this? They've managed to keep his mind alive by simulating an artificial body. His consciousness is being confined to a mental straitjacket, a gear in their infernal machine. They have even stricken his name in humanity, referring to him by an anagram, Ruvik. A crude joke, as if spitting on his grave. Nevertheless, Jimenez continued with the work, so at least Ruvik's death wasn't in vain. In the beginning, this was fine. Mobius and Jimenez would bring in a bevy of patients to use for testing. Subjects that entered STEM would come out all talking about similar experiences and settings, with one difference being that with each new entrant, the world got slightly bigger, with each mind growing the landscape. As Jimenez put it, this suggests that shards of each user's consciousness are left behind inside the STEM, creating a community, as if internally a new world is being built. Of course, there was one slight problem. Ruvik's physical form may have been no more, but his consciousness was still around and slowly began to infect the system. Patients that entered STEM began behaving erratically upon returning to the real world and even reported seeing other patients past traumas. Even more concerning was that every patient claimed to see a hooded figure approaching them. Jimenez was desperate to see what the patient saw, but the risk was too high. It was at this point, Jimenez discovered Rubik's plans for another prototype of STEM. One that used receptors to wirelessly transmit the brain function to unaware users. Jimenez would secretly work on adding the wireless function to STEM while continuing his experiments at the behest of Mobius. 
it wasn't long before patients that entered STEM either died or came out in a catatonic state, not making much sense and of course useless to interview. According to one of Jimenez's audio logs, they needed more sane subjects to cleanse the system, as the ever-growing collective consciousness in STEM was making it unsustainable. Inside STEM, Ruvik was happily slaughtering these patients while trapped in the infernal machine. Over time, the landscape became a hellish place, and anyone who entered the system was either getting murdered by the cognitive version of Ruvik, or succumbing to his will, and the evil within. Get it? Sorry. In a last ditch attempt to shut the system down, Mobius removed Ruvik's brain from the core, but the damage was already done. Ruvik now existed entirely as a conscious entity, a ghost in the machine if you will. In his search for a more stable patient, Jimenez locked into an absolutely amazing test subject, a young Leslie Withers. Leslie seemed to emerge from STEM unfazed by the hellscape and this gave Jimenez an idea. If Leslie could survive inside STEM, as it's a shared consciousness, then so should he be able to survive as well. Unfortunately for Jimenez, Mobius discovered Leslie and the secret work he had been doing. Naughty, naughty! With the relationship souring between Jimenez and Mobius, they decided to send one of their undercover operatives, Julie Kidman, to go and retrieve Leslie. She would be sent in with fellow KCPD pals Sebastian and Joseph as backup, under the guise that they were investigating a multiple homicide. While Sebastian and Joseph were busy dealing with the carnage, Julie would be free to nab Leslie. The administrator warned Kidman that Jimenez might try to activate the wireless signal and if he did, they would all be sucked into STEM. Of course, Jimenez, ever desperate to prove his worth to his cruel employers, activated the wireless signal and entered STEM with Leslie. Now, Jimenez, you are clearly talented, but that was just plain stupid. Idiot! And this is pretty much where the game begins. Sebastian, Joseph and Julie are on patrol and are conveniently called in to investigate. So the next thing to consider is how much of the game takes place in the real world and how much is actually in STEM. Well, let's take a look at the exact point the crew entered STEM for the first time, just in case you missed it. Dispatch, this is Detective Castellanos in 184. What's the situation? Over. 184, be advised. Some problems with Jimenez on the Deacon Memorial. Is there any... God damn it! Jesus! Stop. Right here, this is it. This is the moment. It's this high-pitched frequency which is the wireless signal being broadcasted from the hospital and from this moment on, the wireless signal is taking effect. This is confirmed in the Consequence DLC by Kidman through a flashback. The beacon houses a newer version with a wireless transmitter. All the user hears is a high-pitched tone and they're connected. We've gotten word Jimenez is prepping for unauthorized usage. We would like the trial run to be on our terms, not his. That sound in the patrol car must have been when Jimenez activated it. Joseph, Sebastian, Oscar, they were all pulled in with me. Because the wireless signal only has a short lasting effect, subjects would need to be transferred to terminus tubs in order to be securely hardwired in. This is what happens with the guys during the game. Mobius sweeps in, hooks them up and during the end game, Sebastian wakes up in the lab, but more on that later. Now to talk about the corruption aspect of STEM. It is said that everyone connected to STEM will eventually succumb to the corruption. With the base of STEM being that of Rubik, his overarching psychoticness is ever present and can be easily spread to those inside that are weak willed. This process is slow and depends on the mind of the subject. This is why Joseph spends most of the game cracking because despite being stronger willed than the regular townsfolk, he is still not as strong as Sebastian who only starts to crack near the end of the game. There's no defence against this effect, you can only be mentally conditioned against it as Kidman was. This effect is referred to as domination. As the subject becomes more consumed by the effects, they become more unstable, begin experiencing memory loss or headaches, and over time their mentality degrades until they become a little, well mindless and violent. 
these creatures are referred to as haunted. Certain individuals transformed by the domination effect end up being radically changed inside STEM, becoming creatures like the sadist or even worse, a collected consciousness known as amalgam, but more on that later. So, let's take a deeper look at the haunted enemy. In a nutshell, the haunted are individuals who were once connected to STEM and died inside or succumbed to the domination effect. Once dominated, these ex-humans are now at the behest of Rubik's whim, and are called upon many times throughout the Evil Within to attack Sebastian and co. It's noted throughout the Evil Within that if a person is able to resist the effects of domination or are somehow snapped back to their senses before it fully takes over, the person in question will return to normal. Sadly, they will still remember everything that happens. The Haunted are also not your typical shambling mindless monsters, showing intelligence and wielding an annoying amount of weaponry from time to time. Some even talk. Shush, shush. Don't you fret. Doc, no, don't. Valerio, it's me. The good doctor is here. This is my brother, Valerio. Leslie's original doctor. Peel away. Yes, expose everything. Hey, what are you doing? F in the chat for Valerio Jimenez. According to the Art of the Evil Within, those not linked to STEM may still take this form, but they materialise from subjects' memories. This could explain how variations of the haunted creatures from the church area are inside STEM, having not been brought into STEM directly. In the same area, Noin, Sen and the Sentinel monsters are also not subjects but instead manifested from memories, but more on those later. There are many variants of the haunted enemy, wielding different weapons throughout. The most notable haunted are the Mobius variants seen in the DLC. These haunted glow red as a result of Julie's past afflicting them. The cadaver variant is a creature born from the core of a dead haunted and represents Ruvik's desire to persevere. Finally, you have Mr. Unknown, aka the Ruvik doppelganger. According to the art book, it's a haunted mutation born when the subject and Ruvik synchronize at the highest level. According to Shinji Mikami, by the time a person has reached full domination, the deformation on the surface and the evil that comes from within are a direct reference to the game's name, Evil Within. Very on the nose, but I'll let you off, Mikami. As self-consciousness waned, a sort of stasis was achieved, like two creatures sewn together and forced to live as one, eternally hating the other. Delicious. Eloquently put by Rubik there. The art book further expands on this by noting that the alter ego creature is the result of connecting a subject with disassociative identity disorder to the STEM device. The dominant and alternate personalities blend into a single two-headed creature. These guys might sound frightening, but mechanically they are just tougher and a more sporadic version of the haunted enemy. The small baby-like creatures encountered in Chapter 8 are not actually babies, but instead very small alter egos, sharing the same model as their larger counterparts, but just missing a leg and a lump where the patient's head is. It's unconfirmed, but some have theorised that these creatures are in fact children that are connected to STEM, but this is of course wild speculation. Because Mikami loves giant sea monsters, it was only natural we would see one in the Evil Within. The creature itself was born from subjects that drowned during testing, and their consciousness became lost in STEM. These creatures are unkillable, a pain in the ass, and thankfully only seen in Chapter 11. Art director Ikumi Nakamura is quoted in the art book revealing that originally Shigyo was a woman who was unhappy with how crooked her teeth were, hence the braces. Oh, and another interesting fact, Shigyo means death fish in Japanese. 
Trauma is a hulking and downright scary beast, towering over Sebastian and launching itself at frightening speeds if needed. If it gets angry, it will tear the wooden plank off its back and use it for an even more rapid assault. This creature is not a subject within STEM, but instead born from Ruvik's concept of death and rebirth. The art book further elaborates on this, saying that trauma is based upon Ruvik's rejection of the religion that his father forced on him at an early age. This is evident in the design, with the monster clearly being partially attached to a crucifix. As mentioned earlier, some people that die within STEM take on extraordinary and unique transformations. One such creature is the Sadist. It's hard not to draw comparisons to Mikami's earlier work, but the Sadist definitely reeks of Resident Evil 4's Dr. Salvador. He appears multiple times throughout the Evil Within, firstly prepping Sebastian for his next barbecue, later appearing for a boss fight, and also wielding a rocket launcher for funsies during the final stage of the game. As per the model viewer's description, the sadist is a creature born from the mind of a murderer merged with Rubik's madness. He has lost himself to rage, becoming murderousness personified. The sadist's avatar is also used by Mobius for some of the experiments during the Executioner DLC, attaching it to a convicted murderer and later an ex-soldier in their experiments. It's not really relevant to the main game, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Next up, we have 9 and Zen, which incidentally is German for 9 and 10. These two cheeky rascals are one of the few enemies in the Evil Within that wasn't created from an attached subject, but rather a memory. As to whose memory, well, that's unfortunately unknown. Either way, once you're a part of the system, your memories are no longer your own, and it would only be a matter of time before Ruvik would be able to conjure up these beasts from said memories. In the real world, these two were conjoined twin brothers who were abandoned at birth and left on the doorstep of the Cedar Hill Church cult. Oh dear. This could only mean bad things for the pair, serving as guinea pigs for the cult's nefarious experiments. According to documents, the twins were surgically separated and given growth serum to increase their size. In STEM, these monstrosities serve as guardians of the church, trying to keep Sebastian and co away from the secrets within. If you get past them, there's one more surprise waiting. Also born from the memories within STEM is lovable Pooch Sentinel, the final guardian of the church. I say Pooch, in the real world, Sentinel was actually a regular wolf that guarded the church from intruders. Eventually, the Cedar Hill Church cult would experiment on him also, mutating him and feeding him good old townsfolk as a sacrifice, eventually consuming up to six corpses a day. What a piggy wiggy. Even after all that food, he would still howl for more, scaring the living crap out of his keepers. They kept him locked up in a special cage in the catacombs, which a version of can be seen in-game. Once again, no wolf was hooked up to Stem in order to bring this beast in. He is another product of memories being summoned by Rubik. To this end, it's actually unsure how much of his appearance here is real and what is just a part of Rubik's warp version of Sentinel. The second time round, you actually don't have to defeat this boss, you can just grab Joseph's glasses and get the hell out of there. Defeating it, however, nets you some lovely brain juice and a quip from Sebastian where he calls it a bad dog. It's a wolf! As I mentioned at the start, there are some holes in the plot, especially the lore surrounding the Cedar Hill Church cult, Noin, Sen and Sentinel. It's implied but never confirmed that the cult is a precursor to Mobius. If we ever get a third game, this might come up then, but until then, this is the best explanation I can give of the cult and its horrible experiments. Late in the Evil Within, you are introduced to Quell, the worst octopus you have ever seen. What makes this boss a serious threat is his ability to turn invisible at will, sneaking around like a creepy abductor trying to get Sebastian into the back of his van. Only difference here is that he will straight up eat you. 
all joking aside, I actually quite like this boss. There's a nice build up to the fight where he is seen in several places in the background and even a point where he can take you mid-level before finally having a showdown with Sebastian at the end of the chapter. Invisible threats are always more frightening as you don't know where they're coming from, making this fight exciting and terrifying at the same time. As mentioned in the art book, and I quote, Quell is a creature generated by Rubik's desire to remain unseen by others. It will be discussed in more details later, but Rubik definitely shied away from the outside world, performing his aberrant experiments with only his sister understanding him. After the fire, he would be presumed dead and retreated even further into obscurity, remaining unseen by the world. Well now, isn't this just a mess? I guess that's what happens when you mishmash a load of subconscious minds together. It's all in the name really. Amalgam Alpha is just that, a physical manifestation of the final consciousness of test subjects who died while connected to STEM, combined into one single horrific shape. It finds Sebastian in Chapter 8 as he's making his way to an exit. Lucky for Sebastian, he manages to escape. Later on, while that absolute dick Jimenez is attempting to use Leslie to escape, Ruvik summons Amalgam Alpha to the scene and proceeds to destroy Jimenez. See you later, mate! Shortly after this, you get to fight the thing, which can be tough if you don't know the strats. Just don't go hiding under cars, okay? Next up, we have Shade. Shade serves as a major antagonist in the DLC campaign and spends most of her time searching for Leslie and trying to murder Julie. According to the in-game model viewer, Shade is a physical manifestation of Ruvik's search for a new body, hence why she has a hard-on for Leslie. More on that later. Shade has erratic behaviour which makes her difficult to predict. Early game, if she sees you and catches you, it's game over. You'll know when she catches wind of you because her light turns to a terrifying red as she comes for you. It's noted in the official art book that Shade was originally meant to be called Lightman, serving under Rubik with its head actually being a representation of Beacon Mental Hospital's lighthouse. No no no, I hate spiders and this thing is just a giant spider. Heresy seems like an apt name for it. This absolute asshole chases you throughout chapter 12 and thank Christ you don't fight it on foot. On rails is bad enough. This monster was just another person connected to STEM that completely lost their identity and ended up going on a rampage, devouring the minds of anyone he found. It's known as Heresy because it rejected Ruvik, not letting him synchronise. To this end, Heresy is kind of a free agent, just a maniacal one. According to Akumi Nakamura, it survives by eating its own excrement and she lords it as an eco-friendly creature. Isn't that lovely? In a final bid to destroy Sebastian, Ruvik summons every victim of his research, combining their anger and animosity with his own madness to create his final form, Amalgam, an evolution of sorts on the alpha version seen earlier. Ruvik pilots the creature like a giant mech, sitting deep within the creature's body, only becoming vulnerable at certain points. The creature's head resembles the Shigyo monster, also sporting a similar glass dome to the one on Rubik's head. This final boss fight seemingly embodies everything Mikami loves about horror games, gigantic multiple leg creatures and of course rocket launchers. For reasons I'll explain later, this fight is a fruitless one and Sebastian has already lost. It's still a lot of fun however and wildly ludicrous. Ah, 
here he is. The evil poster boy for the evil within. The Keeper is a physical manifestation of Ruvik's raw rage and the memory of where he kept his research. Research that was taken from his safe by Jimenez and published under his own name, as mentioned earlier. As heard in an audio log, Ruvik was not happy about this. That cockroach, that sycophant, living off me, feeding off my work. I'll have to figure out how we got the combination to my safe. But there's no time for that now. I'm so close. No one can ever have that data. It is mine. My only way. Whoever opens that safe next had better be ready to pay the price. The safe he has for a head represents all the naughty things Ruvik did that he does not want the world to see. Overall, the Keeper is a great villain, providing a consistent urgency during encounters. He's strong and ridiculously quick as he barrels towards Sebastian before trying to smash him with his meat grinder. The cheeky bugger can also teleport. You think you're safe? Ah? Eh. Lock him behind a closed door and he can just teleport using the other safes lying around. He has to terminate himself to do this, which makes him a badass. This is why even killing him does not stop him, with his unbridled rage keeping him going. You've heard of the man too angry to die, right? Perhaps the most interesting thing here, and just something I took away from the whole design, is the Keeper is redolent of Pyramid Head from Silent Hill 2. Tall man? Check. Big metal head? Check. Massive weapon? Check. The final encounter with the Keeper even pits you against two of them, just like in Silent Hill 2. Oh, and you should definitely check out my deep dive on that if you haven't already. For the first year and a half of the Evil Within's development, there was no cohesive enemy concept to serve as the core for this new horror game. Finally, taking inspiration from films like Hellraiser and other previously mentioned video games, lead art designer Ikumi Nakamura came up with a design for the Keeper. This concept was inspired by the initial script Nakamura read, where Rubik was going to give Sebastian a gift wrapped in a safe, and Mikami was looking for a psychologically horrifying character hence coming up with this design. The team nicknamed him Boxman, but he wasn't very well received, mainly because it looked like he was straight out of another horror game. Nakamura defended her choice, however, citing that, and I quote, intentionally using established designs is a foolproof way to get horror across to the audience. As a result, the Keeper's design changed the look of the evil within, making it the game we know today. What a good lad. seems to work. Another one of Nakamura's designs was Laura, another creature that makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable. No thank you. This creature was born from Ruvik's own vengefulness and the painful memory of Laura's tragic death as seen in this flashback. Laura Victoriano, Ruvik's older sister, was the only person who really understood him. They had an extremely close relationship, and as commented by Jimenez, Ruvik's love for her bordered almost on an incestuous level. So, when their parents brought a new land and farm, the land's previous occupants decided it was a good idea to show the Victorianos who really owned the land and set fire to their barn. It just so happens at the time, Reuben and Laura were playing inside, 
One of the villagers even speaks up about hearing children inside while another ignores the warning. Ruvik just escaped, suffering heavy burns while poor Laura was trapped inside. She didn't die there and then, but was badly wounded and left in a vegetative state before dying some time later. This made Ruben's mental state worsen and he would soon start to see visions of her. Inside Stem, all of this culminates into a twisted version of Laura, weak to fire, screaming in agony, constantly seeking vengeance. She is a horrific sight to behold. As mentioned in the art book, Ruvik feels guilty for being the only survivor and that one day she might come for him as well, despite still protecting him, even during death. Her fury is apparent, as she consistently takes us down Sebastian in some of the best panic-inducing encounters in the game. On any difficulty, being trapped in a confined space with a quick-moving one-hit kill machine is always going to get the heart pumping. Thankfully, there is also lots of fire here, which Laura is not a big fan of for obvious reasons. Laura was added to the Evil Within two years into the development process and serves as a great secondary villain, inspired by a blend of classic Japanese monsters and western creatures, such as the Onryo and the Jorogumo. Also, have you seen the ring? On a side note, the designers wanted to leave a piece of humanity in a design, so they left her wearing shoes and if you look real close, braces for her teeth. Ah, Laura. Please don't come near me again, you freaky motherfucker. Ruvik is so integral to everything that goes on in The Evil Within, we've covered quite a lot of him already, so here I'll try and fill in some blanks. Put simply, Ruben Victoriano was a child prodigy. Had he the correct tutelage and care, he could have grown up to do wonders for the advancement in psychotherapy. Sadly, Ruben was mentally disturbed and often indulged in twisted methods with his experiments shutting himself off from the world only with his sister to care for. He met Jimenez at an early age, who instead of steering him off the path he was going down, encouraged it. There is some slightly conflicting information regarding when Rubik and Jimenez met, the game clearly stating on a few occasions that Jimenez met Ruben before he got his scars in the fire, whereas the art book states that Ruben met Jimenez long after the barn incident. I'm inclined to go with the in-game explanation for this. While the art of the Evil Within provides a lot of developer insight which may explain in-development ideas that may have not made it into the final game, there are also a few times where for one reason or another, information is different. The Victoriano family made regular donations to Beacon Mental Hospital and Ruben's father was tied to a religious organisation, donating money to the church and covering up various scandals. This is most likely what links the family to the Cedar Hill Church cult. He was around 10 years old at the time of the fire, which caused his psyche to completely break. He was presumed dead by the fire and locked away by his father, all while being plagued by hallucinations of Laura. Eventually, he snapped and consumed by hatred, murdered his parents, claiming their fortune for his own and skyrocketing his research funds. He kept his brilliance, but completely lost his humanity performing aberrant experiments. Jimenez still assisted him of course, providing him with patients from Beacon to work on and in exchange, Ruben continued to donate to Beacon. He is described by the administrator as a serial killer masquerading as a scientist. Ruben would make sure his victims were aware of the experiments he was performing on them, making use of torture and other nefarious traps. During his early experiments, Ruvik discovered Leslie Withers, who shared the same past traumas as himself. Because of their shared experiences, this meant they were compatible and Leslie would eventually be the key to Ruben getting a new body, one he secretly craved. He noted down that Leslie wasn't compatible and kept that information to himself, only for Jimenez to discover later that Ruvik was lying to him and Leslie was indeed capable of acting as a stable core for Stem. Once it all went sideways and Ruben was turned into Ruvik the Brain by Mobius, his consciousness existed solely inside the machine, with his rage and hatred growing, blame shifting towards Mobius for what they did to him. Ruvik sought to escape, and Leslie would be the key to this. See the beginning of this video for a refresher of how Ruvik got into STEM. As the central villain of Evil Within, 
Ruvik is an utterly brilliant classic psychopath, voiced by the talented Jackie Earl Haley. Ruvik was created about a year and a half into the game's development and was originally planned for more of a sophisticated psychopath, wearing simpler and more elegant clothing. The name Ruvik is a play on the classic puzzle, Rubik's Cube, due to his penchant for traps and his uniquely complex personality. Another character extensively covered throughout this video is probably who I'd consider one of the major villains of The Evil Within, and that's that Dick Jimenez. We've heard his past already in this video, so let's quickly recap. Jimenez is a questionable doctor at Beacon. Check. Beacon receives regular cash from the Victorianos. Check. Jimenez meets young Ruben and encourages his dark tendencies. Check. Jimenez continues to encourage a young, burnt and quite frankly mad Ruben to continue doing dark experiments. Check. Jimenez reveals Ruben to Big Shady Corporation. Check. Jimenez publishes Ruben's work under his own name and then doesn't understand when Ruben gets mad and changes STEM. Check. Jimenez dobs Ruben into Mobius and subsequently gets him killed. Check. Jimenez displays a moment of humanity before becoming curious about Ruben's brain powering STEM. Check. Jimenez then hypocritically works behind Mobius' back on a new STEM. Check. Jimenez hatches a secret plan to use a dangerous machine to suck people into STEM to prove his loyalty. Check. Jimenez sucks a lot of people into STEM and subsequently gets them killed. Check. Jimenez is a dick. Check. Jimenez is pretty much an idiot from the off, and so integral to things that go wrong for all these people, he more than deserves his fate. He plays innocent as he travels through the mindscape, acting shocked as he views his disturbing surroundings. He eventually tries to use Leslie to set everyone free in a STEM machine and almost pulls it off, until Ruvik summons Amalgam Alpha to take care of business. Before he dies, he realises what Ruvik wants, and that's to escape. Upon returning to the real world later, Sebastian finds Jimenez dead in one of the tubs, indicating that when he died in STEM, he also died in the real world. R.I.P. Dick. Ikumi Nakamura was simply told to create a buddy for Sebastian. From there, she designed Joseph from the ground up, giving him Japanese ancestry and Toronto origins due to an old English teacher Nakamura had who was from Toronto. According to The Art of the Evil Within, Joseph's family is descended from ninjas and his name was taken from Japanese shogun Oda Nobunaga. Joseph is Nakamura's favourite character and the one most precious to her. So much in fact that originally Mikami had planned for Joseph to die mid-game but Nakamura argued against the choice. Mikami listened and changed young Joseph's fate, making what happened to him ambiguous. It's only properly confirmed in The Evil Within 2 that he actually survived. Throughout The Evil Within, Joseph makes a great side character and contrast to Sebastian. Joseph always plays by the book, but is weak-willed within the confines of STEM, shown to succumb to the effects of domination on various occasions throughout the game. In the DLC, he has been fully dominated and you are forced to fight him as Julie. Whereas Sebastian has been a bit sketchy with his past behaviours, Joseph has always turned a blind eye until Sebastian became an alcoholic. That's when he turned him over to internal affairs. This act saved their careers but put their friendship on thin ice. On the few occasions Joseph did transform, he seemingly displays extreme guilt which in turn spirals into depression, elaborating to Sebastian that he cannot live with himself after what he did. There could also be a touch of hidden guilt here for turning in Sebastian, but that is just speculation and not confirmed. Finally, on another weird note, Joseph has an uncanny ability to instantly know what notes to check when encountering puzzles. It's unexplained how he knows all this information, but for now, let's just call it video game logic. Out of the three main cops from the KCPD, Kidman is probably the one most shrouded in mystery. Well, initially anyway, the DLC's assignment and consequence do a great job of fleshing out her backstory and giving context to her actions in the evil within. There's a ton to get through, and I could easily spend about 30 odd minutes running through Kidman's backstory alone, so I'm going to sum it up as best as I can. Kidman had quite the rough upbringing, living nearby Cedar Hill Church in a poor town, with parents who treated her and her sibling like a burden. All her parents cared about was the church, giving weight to the musings that it was more like a cult. 
When Kidman was 14, she left a note saying she had gone to heaven, implying she had committed suicide. Her family, however, didn't care and never tried looking for her, the church indoctrination seemingly taking precedent. Upon revisiting the village a few years later, it was abandoned. Kidman left once again and proceeded to drum up quite the criminal record. Eventually, Mobius would approach Kidman offering her a way out, with the alternative being a life of imprisonment. Kidman accepted and underwent indoctrination therapy, as well as having her past examined under a microscope by Mobius. This made things easy for Mobius, giving them all the information they needed to manipulate Kidman into doing what they wanted. She was easy to control. They gave her an apartment and eventually transferred her to KCPD. It was at this time that Sebastian and Joseph were looking into the disappearance of Sebastian's wife, Myra, and were getting too close to answers, Mobius did not want them to find out. Kidman was sent to keep an eye on the pair. As mentioned by the administrator in the DLC, Kidman's main goal at the start of The Evil Within is to find and extract Leslie. He also cites that Sebastian and Joseph are expendable, hoping that her indoctrination will lead her to eliminate them both if the opportunity presents itself. Before Kidman entered STEM, Mobius used an infusion on Kidman, meaning she would be shielded from Rubik in the mindscape. It's noted during a scene by Joseph that it's odd Kidman was captured instead of being killed. She brushes it off as not being seen as a threat, which most likely is down to the infusion she received. Really, this infusion just carried a cognitive version of the administrator into STEM with her, messing with her mind and keeping her on task, using her own past and fears of abandonment to keep her under control. Kidman spends most of the DLC fighting the administrator's logic, finding out new information within STEM that leads her to the truth. She is the real expendable commodity, and all Mobius cares about is the extraction of Leslie, no matter the cost. The extent of Mobius' indoctrination is shown even more so in the DLC, with this scene showing another side of the story. It's not your fault. I'm sorry. Stop! You're making a terrible mistake. You don't understand. You don't know what he'll become. We know exactly what he'll become. That's why we need him. You don't understand what Ruvik is after. Ruvik is a corpse! He's after Leslie. And so are we. And you're more afraid of him than us? Don't patronize me. I have orders. But I can't let him have this boy. <sighs> Leslie is the only one who can... Kidman can see the administrator, whereas it's actually Sebastian. Ultimately, despite accidentally shooting Joseph, Kidman by this point is not on the side of Mobius any longer, battling the administrator and attempting to stop them getting their hands on Leslie. Obviously, this doesn't go to plan. Julie Kidman is a complex character but serves as a great deuteragonist. Kidman, along with Joseph, were originally designed to be prisoners in game as opposed to members of the KCPD, but were changed to fit the narrative and a criminal background was incorporated into Julie's backstory instead. We will look at the immediate fate of Kidman in the ending, but much more is uncovered in The Evil Within 2, which we will look at in a future video. Sebastian fills the role of that rugged veteran on the force who's seen a few things, been a few places, you know what I mean. He is probably the simplest of characters to understand in The Evil Within, mainly because most of his backstory wasn't fleshed out until The Evil Within 2. In the confines of the first game, Sebastian's story is simple. He happily worked for the KCPD, met his wife Myra Hansen and had a child while he worked there. Almost a picture-perfect life. That wasn't to last, as their daughter Lily was seemingly killed in a house fire. Soon after, Myra began acting strangely, telling tales of conspiracies of how their daughter wasn't dead and the fire was staged. Sebastian, however, wanted to brush all notions aside and for them to just get on with their lives. Soon after, Myra would go missing and Sebastian would sink even further into his depression, drinking and smoking heavily until his partner Joseph reported him in a bid to get him back on track. For the most part of The Evil Within, Sebastian is mostly clueless as to what's going on. He is the unwilling hero of this story and even then he doesn't necessarily get the victory. You gotta feel sorry for him, 
he lost everything and then had a really shitty day. It's not until The Evil Within 2 that he feels more clued up and intrinsically invested in what's going on. But in the first game, he has no clue how much is going on behind the scenes and how Mobius is connected to his past. It's kind of funny, but also kind of tragic. Thankfully, Sebastian is still strong of mind, meaning Ruvik can never fully control him, with the domination effect taking hold only once before he is brought to his senses. I guess that makes him a good hero? While we're talking about him, let's fire off some quick Sebastian trivia. In development, Sebastian was originally going to be among those who set the barn on fire that Ruben and Laura were playing in. This was a good change, as giving him that backstory would have made him hard to empathise with. Also, originally Sebastian had no daughter, and the source of his depression was the passing of his wife. In the concept drafts, neither Maya or Lily were fleshed out. Finally, the trench coat he is seen wearing at the start of the game is a gift from his wife, and as mentioned in the art book, feels that its loss is significant to the events taking place. Nurse Tatiana Gutierrez is an interesting character. In the real world, Nurse Tatiana worked at Beacon and disappeared while working a late shift, as seen on the missing poster in-game. She was most definitely used in Rubik's experiments. She serves as the game's merchant hub maiden, offering Sebastian respite from ghoulies and much needed upgrades via brain juice. According to the model viewer, she saw a lot of things that no one should ever see, which left her emotionally dead and this is reflected in the interactions with Sebastian. Other than that, not much else is actually known about her. Nurse Tatiana was originally going to be a bit like the merchant from Resident Evil 4, selling weapons and other items. She started life as a female and went through a ton of designs before eventually becoming a chair. The chair and the interaction made sense, but it was still missing something. By this point, the character of Tatiana had been removed from the game completely, but Ikumi Nakamura liked her so much that she brought her back as a nurse and as an attendant for the chair. In her final form, she became very popular amongst the staff of Tango. Hurts! Hurts! Whoa! Were you warning me about this? You were Leslie, right? I'm a police officer. Maybe I should help you. Should help you? Shit. How am I gonna get you to a hospital? Hospital. 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 Hospital! What the fuck? Ah, Leslie Withers. You gotta feel sorry for the poor lad. He spends most of his time in the Evil Within being chased by everyone and their roommate, either trying to kill him, escape with him, or absorb him? Anyway, in short, Leslie's had it rough. In the design stages, the spec had him down as a 15 year old, but had 10 more years tacked on in all subsequent descriptions, still maintaining his childlike looks and demeanour. According to the art book, Leslie's designer Nakamura is not a fan of the young lad, citing him as very annoying. She also wasn't told of his age change. His tale of tragedy started young, with his whole family being murdered in front of him. This broke something inside Leslie, and he ended up as a patient of Beacon Mental Hospital. As seen earlier, Ruvik firstly discovered how unique Leslie is, but hides it from Jimenez, stating that he was a failed test subject. Then later, Jimenez finds out that Leslie is the perfect candidate for STEM due to his shared trauma with Ruvik. Because they both went through a similar ordeal, according to Jimenez, Leslie emerged from STEM cognizant, calm, and able to fully relay his experiences. Leslie was also wanted by Mobius, due to having those similar brainwaves. It was the only way in their eyes to truly replace Rubik in STEM, using Leslie as the new core. Inside STEM, Leslie is drawn to Rubik, despite being completely afraid of him. Leslie spends a lot of his time seemingly wandering off with no real direction, but with Rubik as the architect of the mindscape, I'm pretty certain Rubik is acting as a guiding hand, but that's just my theory. He and Rubik's unique brainwaves form a silent bond between the pair, and Leslie senses danger around every corner, commenting on things that are about to happen. As he wanders, he displays signs of his traumatic past, mumbling to himself, displaying high levels of confusion, repeating words over and over. He is somewhat aware of what's going on, 
but he is also detached from his surroundings, seemingly living in his own world. Everyone is after Leslie for different reasons. Sebastian wants to save him, despite not having a real motive aside from doing his job. Kidman wants to extract him from Mobius, then later feeling it better just to kill him. Jimenez wants to use him to get out, and Ruvik knows that Leslie is his way out. The closer he gets to Ruvik, the more he breaks down and at one point begins to channel Ruvik. This is only really seen in the DLC, but it showcases how powerful their connection actually is, with Ruvik fully in control during this scene. Later, Jimenez manages to find Leslie and hook him up to a STEM machine, nearly triggering a way out for everyone. Ruvik can't have that however, and sends Amalgam Alpha after him. After this, it's Kidman who takes the reins and attempts to shoot him in the park. Another disturbance once again saves the day. Then shortly after, Kidman makes one last ditch attempt to stop Ruby from getting what he wants, but it is too late. Everything has converged at the centre of Beacon and Ruvik makes his final play, melting Leslie into water. This leads us to the end, and what it means for those alive. After the brilliant boss fight with Amalgam, Sebastian finds himself in a room with a cognitive version of Ruvik's brain and proceeds to destroy it. Obviously, this act is just symbolic, as we already know that in the real world, Mobius removed Ruvik's brain long ago, with his consciousness just existing inside STEM, longing for release. Splicing in Julie's scene as well, she is the first awake, seemingly freeing herself from STEM and finding herself standing in the STEM chamber with the others. She sees Leslie waking up and approaches him before she's joined by Mobius agents. Then, a certain Mobius agent called Myra turns up. Myra, eh? Or on that will be covered in a future video, but if you're thinking what I'm thinking, you'd be correct. After Julie's short debriefing, she walks over to Sebastian's pod, sees that he's waking up and decides to keep him off Mobius' radar by declaring him dead, along with Jimenez and Oscar Connolly, who are also seen in pods. After the Mobius agents have cleared, Sebastian emerges from the pod, dazed and confused. He goes to leave and is greeted by his mates at the Popo. Poor Sebastian, still a little clueless as to what's going on. The most important thing to notice in this scene is the spotting of Leslie, who is seen walking away. His demeanour is different. He is no longer walking in that frightened fashion, but instead like someone else we know. It's heavily implied that Rubik is now in full control of Leslie, with the scene in STEM implying that he absorbed Leslie's mind. Now, you're probably wondering why Rubik couldn't just show up at the beginning when they all entered STEM and just take Leslie then. He was seemingly powerful enough, right? Well, there's a number of theories and explainers, but nothing that's ever been confirmed. Rubik does mention in the audio one he presumably made while he was trapped in STEM referring to the place as a prison. This would infer that despite Ruvik having great power inside STEM, not everything is completely under his control. It's also inferred that the closer you are to the core, the more influence and control Ruvik exerts. He and Leslie are linked, and Leslie spends a lot of time subconsciously making his way to the core. So maybe Ruvik just can't take him and needs Leslie to come to him. Going back to the Matrix again, it's exactly the same. STEM just like the Matrix has rules, some can be bent and others can be broken. That's why the good guys are able to survive as long as they do, because STEM is not only their prison, it's also Rubik's and he wants out. He just doesn't have a body to go back to. A similar thing is done in the Matrix, with Agent Smith transferring his consciousness to a normal human and leaving the Matrix for a time. This is the same principle. So, Rubik is free, but what does that mean? Well. A big disappointment here is that we never found out. Evil Within 2 never touched on his fate and instead focused on Myra and Lily. I'm fine with this as long as it's covered in another Evil Within title, if we ever get one. It would be interesting to know if Ruvik retained any power upon leaving STEM and what his motives are now. The Evil Within is loaded with easter eggs and homages to other franchises. In this section, I'm going to specifically go over a few Resident Evil ones that are pretty cool. Firstly, the main one you would have seen but may not have remembered is the first time you encounter Oscar Connolly after the bus crash. It's a shot for shot reference to the first time you encountered a zombie in Resident Evil 1. 
I kind of feel Mikami allowed this one as he was the director of Resident Evil 1. So good job there buddy. Of course, you can't help but draw comparisons to these two, Dr. Salvador and the Sadist. Mikami did say in an interview once that he loves chainsaws and weapons. Other probable references include the pistol ammo found in The Evil Within, which bears a very close resemblance to ammo found in Code Veronica, one being called Howling Wolf and the other called American Wolf. There is of course numerous typewriters found around the game, and when you first wake up in a hospital safe area, you're treated to a camera angle switch that is very familiar to early Resident Evil games. The mansion you arrive at in Chapter 9 is a massive reference to Resident Evil 1's mansion, and the final boss is taken on with a rocket launcher because of course it is. You have to have a ridiculously oversized boss and rocket launchers. It's also noted that Dr. Jimenez and Luis Serra from Resident Evil 4 are very similar characters. Both were scientists with hidden secrets, both were of Hispanic descent, both assisted the protagonist on his mission and both died. Whether this is intentional is anyone's guess, but it's interesting to see the similarities. Now, in a future video I will be covering The Evil Within 2. It would have been great to tie it all together here, but there's so much content to cover already I didn't want to make this a 2 hour video. What I can say is that Sebastian does indeed get his day and you discover the truth about Myra and Lily's disappearance. And we dive deeper into the nefarious Mobius. Now that we're rounding up this video, let's have a look at some quick fire numbers. The Evil Within on PS4 has an average critic review of 75% on Metacritic, rating slightly higher on Xbox One with an average score of 79%. One of the best reviews came from Game Informer, giving a massive 90%. The average user score on Metacritic across both platforms is a decent 7.5. Scores, while still being mostly positive, were met with frustrations from many critics and gamers alike, ripping into it because they felt it lacked originality or that there were many performance issues that ruined the experience. In the first week of release, it sold over 800,000 units across North America, Japan and Europe, across all formats. To this day, The Evil Within is estimated to have shifted over 4.2 million copies, which is not bad. At time of recording, The Evil Within has been completed on PC by Amawolf in a speedy 2 hours and 37 minutes and 18 seconds. That's bloody quick! The console record is on PS4, also by Animal Wolf, coming in at 2 hours 48 minutes and 51 seconds. Links to both these runs, if you're interested, will be in the description. Right, that's it for the second episode of Deep Dives. If you like what you've watched today, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and also like this video. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone that watched my first deep dive on Silent Hill 2, and also thank you for all the feedback. Please keep the comments and feedback coming. What have I done right? What have I done wrong? And did I miss anything? Please follow me on Twitter at DonPedroX for regular updates on upcoming videos. If you like what I do and fancy supporting me, I now have a Patreon. There will be a link in the description of this video. You can go on there, choose a reward tier and get one of the benefits on offer. More tiers will be added over time. Finally, always remember, do your fucking research. Right, see you next time.